Chicago Tonight, Latino Voices, is made possible in part by Allstate and the Searle Funds at the Chicago Community Trust, and by the support of these donors. Good evening, y bienvenidos to Chicago Tonight, Latino Voices. I'm Michael Puente, reporter with WBEZ Chicago. Thank you for sharing part of your weekend with us on the show tonight. Reports of agricultural labor trafficking are on the rise during the pandemic. We talked to local organizations about how they are trying to stem the tide. Looking for last minute holiday gift ideas? Find out what you can pick up at some of Chicago's holiday pop-ups. A Chicago-based photographer focuses on immigrants who own and operate small businesses. And a Mexican Catholic tradition takes to the streets of Buena Park in the days leading up to Navidad. First off tonight, in Illinois, farming is big business. As one of America's leading producers of soybeans, corn and pork, the Illinois Farm Bureau estimates that Illinois' agricultural industry and related activity contribute more than $50 billion to the state's economy. But the nature of farm work and the structure of our nation's migrant labor program make the people who perform long hours of labor in Illinois' more than 72 million farms vulnerable to abuse. And the COVID-19 pandemic has only exacerbated an already alarming situation. According to analysis of data from the U.S. National Human Trafficking Hotline, the last year has seen a more than 70 percent increase in reports of agricultural labor trafficking. Joining us now with more are Miguel Caberlein Gutierrez, executive director of the Legal Aid Society of Metropolitan Family Services, and Maggie Rivera, president and CEO of the Illinois Migrant Council. Thank you both of you for joining us here today on Latino Voices. Thanks for having us. Well, Miguel, we'll get started with you. What defines the difference between labor abuses and human trafficking? Yeah, so it's it's really, there, there's a spectrum really along the lines of what is labor abuses that on the final end of it is is labor trafficking. It's, it's truly when there's force fraud or coercion that keeps a person basically indentured to an employer in some way or fashion. And um, we see certainly a lot of it in the agricultural community. And Maggie, for what you, you do in your work, how can you spot a legitimate employment situation on a farm and one of trafficking? Uh, well, one way would be if we are talking to an individual and their answers seem to be rehearsed, or if they don't have any kind of eye contact and uh, are not willing to talk to us by themselves. All right. And Miguel, do we have any estimates of how many people are affected by agricultural labor trafficking in Illinois? You know, I, I don't know that we have any specific numbers. And, and, and the reason for that is because it, because of the type of work and it's a migratory workforce and because of the changing markets and things, you don't always know even how many people are in the stream of migrant agricultural work. So when it comes to trafficking, there are people who may be in situations where they're trafficked for a certain period of time, then they're no longer in that trafficking situation, then they re-enter. So, but we do know that within the agricultural community, um, there's a high percentage of people who, when asked about situations, have identified some situation that would lead to trafficking. All right. And Maggie, um, what signs of human trafficking do you train your advocates to look for? Um, probably the most notable would be any signs of physical abuse or perhaps uh, poor living conditions or uh, perhaps sometimes when we require that they provide us with some kind of uh, documentation um, that they tell us they, they, they don't have that because their employer keeps that for them. So those kind of little signs would be the ones that we look for. And Miguel, your organization filed a lawsuit this year against a local farming com company with charges of labor trafficking. Can you tell us about this case? Um, so 
I'm not sure the, the specific one you're referring to, but cer certainly we have brought different cases against employers and, and the scenarios are often similar. The, I think the way the agricultural industry, at least the larger sort of conglomerates work is they bring in a large labor force with a recruiter or a recruitment company. And that recruitment company has quite a bit of leverage into what promises they're making people and how they induce them into the work. And so oftentimes it's that as we find that people have been told you're gonna to make so much money if you come here, you do this. And then when they get here, they might be given a certain amount of money but they're held in a situation where they can't freely or believe that they can freely leave because of the debt that's owed to the recruiter. I see. And Maggie, how does your organization work with farms and laborers to educate them on labor rights? Well, um, when, when we uh, start the season, normally we have um, had the opportunity to build some kind of rapport with uh, growers and will ask uh, to go into the farms and provide the trainings that we do. And when we bring trainings of um, health related or any kind of protection trainings, that's when we bring in also the information on their labor rights and um, work with other entities around the uh, state that uh, can also partner with us in bringing this inform information to them. And Miguel, what is it about the structure of H-2A visa that makes migrant labor susceptible to trafficking and what can be done to help fix those flaws in your opinion? Yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a very flawed program. Um, I think employers believe they need it because they believe they can't find U.S. eligible workers to do the work. But an employer really has to go to the government and say, I can't find enough workers here. Then they offer these work visas to, to folks in different countries, and they use the recruiter to go there. So the recruiter at the front end is promising certain things. And oftentimes, without anyone knowing, they are basically bribing people for those jobs. So a lot of people are paying up front for the visas, and that money is held against them while they're doing the work. And when they get here and they arrive here, they may not even know where they are sort of geographically. They don't have, they're very isolated. They don't have access to resources or community agencies. And a lot of community agencies, certainly like Maggie's and ours that do outreach, a lot of employers prohibit us from trying to reach workers and share information with them. So I think it is an issue of on the very front end of when workers are going through the consular process to get the visa, they are not given the information about where they're going and who they can reach out to if there's a problem. And that I think would certainly alleviate a lot of issues of isolation and who they can speak to if they feel they're in, a, in danger. Well, we're gonna have to leave it there. Our thanks to Miguel Caberline Gutierrez and Maggie Rivera. Thank you. Thank you. I'm back with more Chicago Tonight Latino Voices right after this. If you still got a few names to cross off your holiday gift list, you're not alone. According to a survey by market research company, the NPD Group, 52% of holiday shoppers expect to pick up gifts during the week before Christmas. For those of you among that 52%, here's a little bit of holiday cheer. There's still plenty of time to find handmade gifts that do good for artists and artisans, not only in Chicago, but also in countries all over the world. Joining us now to let us know what we can pick up at their pop-ups are Esperanza Salgado, artist and owner of Bruja Co. in Evergreen Park, Catherine Bissell Cordova, executive director of Chicago Fair Trade, which has a pop-up shop in Andersonville, and Erica Espinosa, co-owner of Colores Mexicanos, which is pop -up, popping up on Michigan Avenue. And welcome all of you to Latino Voices. And Erica, we'll, we'll get started with you. Your business, Colores Mexicanos, is popping up on the Magnificent Mile. Can you tell us what it's where shoppers can find there? Hello, how are you? Uh, yes, Colores Mexicanos, we are Colores Mexicanos. We work together with artisans from different communities all across Mexico. 
and everything in our store is handmade by them. Wow, wow. And Esperanza, your shop is hosting a one-day pop-up. Can you tell us what folks can find at your store? Hello, so I am the owner of Bruja Co. Um, you can find anything from coffee, art, Mexican hot chocolate, and then I'm gonna have various artists coming out that are also doing, um, you know, uh, photography. We have drag queens coming out to perform. So it's gonna be a wonderful day. Wow. And Catherine, Chicago Fair Trades pop-up in Andersonville is there through December 24th. What kind of goods might people find there? Hi, sure, yeah, you can find a whole range of uh, <laughs> fair trade goods from slippers to pajamas, olive oil, coffee, chocolate, uh, plushies, uh, clothing, jewelry, home decor, uh, holiday decor. Uh, we've got 6,000 square feet of all handmade fair trade items from over 30 countries. Wow, that's amazing. Erica, what is it like being a small local business on the Mag Mile? We are very lucky and very blessed to be here, representing our culture. Um, uh, all of our artwork is this kind of pieces made by hand, and we are a partnership with the Magnificent Mile Association and the, the, the Chicago City. Wow. And Esperanza, why is it important to you to, why is it important to you to showcase the work of local women of color? So one of the biggest things I draw from my own personal experiences and as a trained uh, musician and artist, I realized that I wasn't going to be able to find these opportunities um, with other folks. And I knew that I needed to make room at the table. Um, but that didn't just mean for myself. It also meant for my community and the people that are also um, share identities with me. Wow. And Catherine, why should people seek out fair trade goods as holiday gifts? Well, they should seek them out all year round, but especially for holiday gifts, it's uh, everyone's so happy when they come in here and buy things and know that the money is going to pay fair wages. Uh, I, part of fair trade is um, environmental sustainability, okay. community development. So part of the funds go back to communities, aside from paying a fair wage that, that people can use then for different community projects that they choose that they know that they need. Um, so it's just a way to vote with your dollars. And when you buy fair trade, you're voting for a more fair, just world. Right. And Erica, I know you probably have a lot of gifts in your store. What is the one thing that stands out? We have things like this kind of painting clay pieces. Wow. Different kind of all of them are one of a kind, very high quality, <laughs> things like this. Wow, that's amazing. And Esperanza, you too, what, what are some of the unique things somebody can find at your establishment, at your pop-up? So I would say the number one thing is the freshly roasted coffee. I roasted right before an event. It's wow. two days prior. It takes about two days to degas, and that's at its peak. So when you take it home, you, ha you have, like, the freshest possible coffee. You can also get, like, the hand Mexican uh, hot chocolate, which is of my own making. And it has, you know, all the rich flavors of cinnamon, sugar, and vanilla um, that's extracted. Um, it's not the imitation vanilla. So you have that stuff. And then you have the art, of course. Um, so you can have a unique piece for, you know, your loved ones. Wow. And Catherine, you, there's, so, there's so many things. People want a very unique gift. So what, for that hard to find shopper, what would you recommend at your place? What could they find that is just totally unique? Well, there's so many things, but one, <laughs> one thing that's very popular here, we have these uh, flying mobiles um, made by Afro-Colombian single parents uh, from a business called Tulia Artisans Gallery, and they're, um, people just go crazy. There's a Frida, they're not, yeah, there's a Frida, there's a flying pig, there's a unicorn, there's, there. yeah, and those are not something you see everywhere. And Erica, I will wrap it up with you. What has been the react, the reception you've received from the public of having Colores Mexicanos on the Mag Mile? 
Colores Mexicanos, this has been a very step for us as community, as family business. We are very proud to represent our culture here in downtown, to be the first uh, Mexican cultural place in the Magnificent Mile. We want to keep the space for more time if it's possible. We are in the 605 North Michigan Avenue. And please came and support us. Uh, the city needs need us here. We are a lot of uh, Mexicans in the city and we need to be represented. Fantastic. And you can find links and information on all of these pop-up shops on our website, wttw.com slash news. And that's where we're gonna have to leave it with our guests. Our thanks to Esperanza Salgado, Catherine Bisso Cordova, and Erica Espinosa. Many immigrants dream of owning and operating a small business. A Chicago-based photographer has a personal understanding of immigration, and he has spent years documenting small businesses. He calls his project Immigrant Owned, and it's about to be expanded in a big way. Producer Mark Vitale has the story. In Pilsen, a photographer revisits a bakery he knows well. Immigrant-owned businesses are like as American as it gets. Largely the people doing this kind of work and, and still taking a risk and opening up a small business, you know, are immigrants. It's people that are new to the country and it is very much that American dream, which for many people is alive and well, and, and, but at the same time, it's still got that very risky element, you know. Many businesses I've been to and photographed, I went back later and they're not there, they're closed. He makes portraits of the people and the places. This table gets a lot of use, man. I'll go into a store that catches my eye, and I'll go in and I'll look around and introduce myself and tell them a little bit about my project and, you know, ask a little bit about, you know, the history of their business. It's almost like being invited into someone's home, depending on the way people decorate their shops and, and, and the way family exists in those spaces. If we lose that, it's all going to be Dunkin' Donuts and Starbucks, and it's just going to suck, you know. <laughs> Jonathan Castillo's other projects have included documenting car culture in Southern California and an early effort photographing the action at a paintball course that he managed in his native Los Angeles. Now an adjunct professor at Columbia College, Castillo had modest beginnings. My grandmother definitely had some stories. You know, she came into the country undocumented and, you know, was deported several times and kept coming back and basically was really determined to just have her life here. My dad had a small business, so while he isn't technically an immigrant himself, you know, he's the child of immigrants, and uh, he had a little computer store when I was growing up, so I used to spend a lot of time in my dad's storefront. And, uh, you know, I'd get off of school, come over there, hang out in the shop, you know, till late at night, do my homework there. So I do have a certain kind of affinity for these kinds of spaces just growing up in one. Castillo's work will be on view in large format at O'Hare Airport when the Terminal 5 expansion is completed. He is now in the fifth year of this ongoing series. Overall, I think the project is a celebration of the contribution of immigrants to the city as a whole and to the fabric of the many unique different communities we have, the different neighborhoods we have in the city. For Chicago Tonight, this is Mark Vitale. Highlights of Jonathan Castillo's photography project, Immigrant Own, will be unveiled at O'Hare later in the, in the new year. You can see more of its photography on our website. Beloved Mexican singer Vincente Fernandez, El Rey of Mexican ranchera music, died this week at 81 years old, and fans around the world are mourning his loss. Over his decades-long career, Fernandez's mighty baritone graced over 100 albums that became the soundtrack to many families' lives. He also starred in dozens of movies. But in recent years, Fernandez has been criticized for making racist and homophobic remarks, as well as inappropriate conduct. Music journalist and founder of Intrufante, Sandra Tavino, says that while Fernandez's musical legacy will surely endure, it is important to acknowledge his shortcomings as well. He was such a, a legend, uh, such an icon in the Mexican community of this type of music, ranchera music and mariachi music, and people are really, really mourning his, his death. And that music, I think, has a deep connection with uh, immigrants, like my father talks about ranch life, uh, where he was from, he was from the ranch, and uh, talking about be the land that you were from with such pride, no matter where you are, I think that's the the 
the biggest connection that people who love his music have and that's why they're so impacted right now by his death he also left a legacy of misogyny and homophobia and sexual harassment and uh, he had a vile disdain for groups of people he deemed unworthy we don't have to dwell on the negative but we shouldn't also just pretend it doesn't exist because uh, the tragedies will continue if we don't at least, at least acknowledge that there were faults pero que en paz descanse You'll find more of Vicente Fernandez's life and legacy on our website. Up next, a Mexican Catholic tradition takes to the streets of Bueno Park. Stay with us. Don't ever miss Chicago Tonight. Subscribe to our podcast. Get a daily download of our show delivered to your desktop or mobile device. Go to WTTW.com slash Chicago Tonight Podcast and subscribe. For Catholic Latinos, the Christmas season means not just one or two nights of celebration and prayer, but several. The unofficial start for many Latinos is December 8th, a holiday that honors the Virgin Mary. And while customs vary from country to country, some have crossed borders and become beloved to many across the diaspora. One such celebration that originates in Mexico brings the faithful together for nine days leading up to Christmas. Producer Erica Gunderson visited a Northside parish that has brought the tradition of Las Posadas from the sidewalks of Buena Park. It's a beautiful sharing uh, of culture, and even for, I think, our immigrant community, that often feels truly not welcome, <laughs> like Joseph and Mary, uh, to see uh, other people who are not of our culture opening their doors for a Mexican tradition. It just shares how our faith is able to transcend culture and this beautiful sharing happens, which is what we call community. For nine evenings each December, the parishioners of St. Mary of the Lake Catholic Church take to the streets of Buena Park to ask their neighbors for shelter. They're observing Las Posadas, a Catholic tradition that commemorates the journey Joseph and Mary made as they sought a refuge where Mary could give birth to the Christ child. The tradition originated in Mexico as a way for the Catholic Church to evangelize to indigenous peoples. Las Posadas are observed in Mexico with a procession led by parishioners dressed as Mary and Joseph visiting homes designated as inns or posadas. The St. Mary of the Lake Parish adapted the tradition with a procession through the church's neighborhood. We knock on, on a neighbor's door and then we ask, you know, in God's name, reliving what Joseph did, would you give shelter, you know, to Mary? And then there's a response from inside the home. They're like, go away, don't bother us, which is exactly what they lived. Alegria, alegria y the procession ends when the pilgrims are welcomed inside and a celebration begins. One beloved element of that celebration is a steaming pot of homemade ponche, bursting with the flavors of Mexico in December. At St. Mary of the Lake, the ponche is made by the Esparza family. These are called tejocotes, and this is one of the most important ingredients in the entire recipe. The Esparzas have been St. Mary of the Lake parishioners for more than 40 years. Consuelo Esparza learned how to make ponche in her native Mexico. I remember the flavor when my grandma made the ponche. I was maybe uh, seven years old, started to drink ponche, and now my grandsons, they love the ponche, my grandsons. And she has passed the family recipe on to her daughter, Eileen. Even though I was born here, my, my, my son was born here, they still like enjoy this tradition, so it's something that everybody looks forward to. Father Dorantes says the St. Mary of the Lake Parish, which combined with St. Lourdes earlier this year, is excited to come together once again after taking 2020 off during the pandemic. We have one of the most uh, diverse Catholic ch churches or Catholic parishes uh, in the Archdiocese of Chicago. Uh, we have people from Africa, from Asia, uh, from Latin America, and now our young white urban professionals that are moving into the neighborhood. So what I have found uh, is that there are, the community here in Buena Park is rather open uh, to all the traditions and the richness of, of our culture and of our faith. And I think these traditions of Christmas and in preparation for Christmas uh, allow us to come together uh, precisely to remember that we do belong to one another, that we are sisters and brothers, that you just didn't live the isolation yourself. I lived it too, right? And coming together once again to recognize the beauty and the dignity of human life and as we enter into these uh, conversations and celebrations with one another. For Chicago Tonight, Latino Voices, this is Erica Gunderson. The St. Mary of the Lake Parish welcomes all to join them for holiday celebrations. You'll find more about that on our website. 
And that's our show for this weekend. Be sure to check out our website, WTTW.com news for the very latest from WTTW News. And join WTT News correspondent Johanna Hernandez this Monday night for our next Latino Voices virtual community conversation. She's speaking with community leaders about the diversity of holiday traditions within Chicago's Latino communities. That's Monday night at 8. Visit WTTW.com events to RSVP. And don't forget, you can catch my reporting on 91.5 FM WBEZ. Now, note before we go, we'll take this, we're going to take a break for the holidays next weekend, but please join us again in the new year on January 1st for a special edition show. Now, for all of us here at Chicago Tonight Latino Voices, I'm Michael Puente. Thank you for sharing part of your weekend with us. Happy holidays and buenas noches. Closed captioning is made possible in part by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, wishing all a happy and healthy holiday season.